so there's a lot of theological argument about where is the point of contact with God? Where do we find and understand God? And there's a theologian named Emil Brunner who said that God lives inside us. That's where God is located. And he bases that on the idea that we have echoes of the Garden of Eden still inside our heart and minds and souls. And Karl Barth, who is another theologian, has said, know that God is truly beyond us, that God is something so hard for us to understand, so unfathomable, that God is ultimately distant and other. And today we hear the Apostle Paul talking about that amidst hard times in this life, we can find comfort in the fact that it is Christ who lives inside us. We heard in his letter to the people of Corinth, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. There was a Benedictine monk named Bede Griffith who traveled around the world and asked people of faith, where is God? And interestingly, the Hindus and the Buddhists answered by pointing to their hearts. While generally, people who followed Jesus, Christians and Jews and Muslims, pointed to the heavens and outside around them. And so I'm wondering, if Bede should come to you and ask you this question, where is God? Would you think inside or outside? Would you look here or up or out there? I had, I've had the experience of sensing God in both places, and I wonder if you have as well. I've told the story before about how my fourth grade teacher at the Bethany School in Taipei, Taiwan, said to me, Jesus is knocking on your heart. Just say yes and let him in. And so I thought I carried a little tiny Jesus in my heart with me everywhere that I went. I literally believed Jesus lived inside of me. And yet I've had the experiences of really thinking that I'm finding the divine outside in the world, in others when they care for me, in kindness from strangers, in the beauty of creation, in glorious music, in so many ways that I would imagine also speak to you of something that is so beyond what we understand of this mundane world and the reality that is presented to us at times. If Paul does say that our inner nature is always being renewed, he reminds us that that renewal ends when the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. That's a reminder that everything that is human will crumble and fail at some point. Our cities, our homes, even our lives. And that may be why, as he said, we lose heart. It's when sort of the reality of what we expect does not match the what is. I've had experiences, and I think most of us have, where something happens and we say, why? Why, God? Why me? Or why her? Or why this? And another theologian has said, why not? Life is just what happens. And so why wouldn't hard things happen in the world and to each one of us? And the point is maybe remembering that God is in all of those things if God is residing both within us and without us. Because good and bad or hard things happen to everyone. Life is beautiful and messy and challenging and rewarding and lovely and hard and ugly, and the list could go on and on and on. Life is complicated. There's a spiritual author named Glennon Doyle who describes life as brutal, beautiful and brutal. And I think that kind of sums it up because sometimes even the beauty 
of the world can knock us over so strongly that it feels a little brutal. But even in the midst of the hard things, we search for those things that we know are eternal. And so if our inner nature is grounded in Christ, as Paul tells us, and divinity lives outside of us in the world and all of creation, because we know God created it and named it good, then there is another reality that we can work to restore even in the midst of the hard things. If we recognize that not everything can be so easily seen. People who practice yoga, yogic folks talk about being present in the moment. And Buddhists speak of suffering because we are attached to things that are impermanent. That we care too much about the things that we see before us what may not really be what matters. And so it's our challenge then to accept both the what is and the reality that God is in it, in all of it, no matter what. So I think Paul's answer to Bede's question of where is God would be a both and, which we like to speak of a lot in the Episcopal Church. I believe Paul would point to his heart and then also point above and around and among. Because Paul seemed to understand that they both can happen at the same time. There's a Celtic idea of thin places, this idea where um, our human lives and the divine sort of rub up against each other and we get glimpses or glimmers that we can't quite explain that describe just a little bit of the spiritual dimension of the world. I took a class in seminary called Personal Spiritual Experiences, or PSEs. My professor had done her dissertation on these experiences by interviewing dozens and dozens of people about when is a time that you have been confronted by the divine, however it appeared to you, and maybe you can't explain it, Maybe it's meaningful only to you, and yet in that moment, you were aware of something more. And that's why they're called personal, because sometimes we're even a little embarrassed to share them. We think, oh, people are going to think I'm crazy that I think that, or that just sounds weird, or maybe I'm just making things about me. But does it matter? Does it matter if a moment or a space or an interaction makes you feel more connected to God and love? My answer is it doesn't matter how. It matters that, yes, it has happened. Because no one can define it for you. An example that I had recently um, was when Dennis, my um, husband's father, died last year. And we unexpectedly had to fly back from Indiana to Denver to be present for the family. And on the plane was one of those very rare times when the northern lights were present over middle America. And because we were in the air, it was like they were level with us. And so as we flew home to grieve with the rest of the family, we were aware of this truly celestial beauty surrounding our airplane, blanketing the earth, and it was that sense of more, of the divine that could be seen in our midst that gave us such great comfort. I'm sure other people saw them and thought all sorts of other things, but because it matters more what we are experiencing inside and what we do for that, it was a moment for us of God's beauty and grace and presence. Sometimes we think of these things as just coincidences or deja vu. Interestingly, um, there's a man named Rupert Sheldrake who talked about nature and animals also have this sort of sixth sense about love and connection. And he studied dogs. And what he studied was how dogs react when their people are on their way home 
Because I think if you've ever had an animal, sometimes you're aware of like, um, the dog seems to always be waiting at the window or the door when you walk in. Or um, you're getting ready to go and the dog realizes you're not just going for, you know, your regular work day, you're actually leaving for a period of time. And so they studied in a blind study and with no one knowing the comings and goings of folks with their dogs. And they found that there was a 10-minute window when the person was returning home that the dog seemed to know that the person was on their way. And it was too big a window to have heard, you know, the sound of the car or to have any visual clues because the timing was all off. And it was fascinating to think that those we love love us and that we are aware of one another in space. You may have had that experience if you've ever cared for a newborn and you might wake up right before the baby cries. Or you're thinking of someone you love and surprise the phone rings and it's their voice on the other end. I think that there are ways that love shows up and connects us that we can't really explain and yet remind us of that spiritual reality that's in the midst of the tangible reality of our lives. We talked about Elijah hearing the still small voice. We heard about Samuel being called by God last week three different times. We know Moses followed God's pull to go up onto the mountaintop to see God's glory. And we can see God's glory all sorts of places if we remember to look. So if God's presence and triumph are both internal and external. And if we believe that, like Paul said, that God, that the resurrected Christ renews us from both the inside and the outside by turning us inside out. And then we believe that God continues to birth in our midst and before our very eyes, a new heaven and a new earth then it becomes so much easier when we ask why to say, why not? Because we know God is in our midst. So here are my questions for you good people. Are we paying attention to how God and love show up within us and without? And are we seeking God from within and without? Are we responding like the Apostle Paul and both speaking of God and pointing toward God? As he said to the people of Corinth, I believed, so I spoke. How is your life speaking of God? How do people know that you are a follower of Jesus by what you do and how you show up? How is all of our faith helping bring God's presence not only into the life of our parish, but into the lives of our neighbors and our communities and the world? Let us be people who respond to Bede's question, where is God? By pointing both to our hearts and to the world and up, recognizing that God is within and among and around us everywhere, and that we in turn can be vessels for God in serving the world. May we never lose heart. Amen.